Okay, um, I'm going to kick it off um, because there is a lot of material to cover. My name is Yarek Mishik. Unfortunately, my partner in crime, Venkat, couldn't make it. He's part of the GTS team, so our services team, and uh, obviously he ended up going to a customer location rather than to this lovely uh, city of Paris. So I'll be holding the torch for him and for myself. So first of all, a uh, quick intro. I've been with IBM for 20 years, believe it or not. And for the last six years or so, I've been working on cloud, which was initially called within IBM as a new enterprise data center. Um, so let's just uh, quickly look at the scope of this presentation here. So what I'm going to cover is basically <clears throat> what we did within IBM, and it was a joint effort between the group that I represent, which is uh, STG, which is the server group, and the GTS, which is our services group. And uh, working with them, particularly uh, the part of uh, services, which is called uh, strategic outsourcing. So they have a lot of uh, engagements with customers where they need to go in, uh, stand up the entire infrastructure, set up uh, middleware and end user applications, and then run it, right? So that's how they make their money. Uh, they make their money by doing this over and over and over again. And the challenge here is that whatever you do in any data center, you deal with four fundamental uh, services or four fundamental entities. And this would be what? First is compute, storage, network. What's the fourth one? Probably the most important one. Why do you need those three? Well, you typically need those three because you want to run some kind of workloads on top of that, right? Just the infrastructure itself is meaningless and useless if you don't have workloads. In other words, applications and software to be running on that particular infrastructure. So what we did is we thought about how do you actually eliminate this incredible cost inherent to standing up complex infrastructures for typical traditional applications, right? Uh, you've been probably to many sessions during this week, and I attended myself some of those. And uh, everybody gets very excited for a good reason about those born-on-the-cloud applications. That requires, however, some significant upfront investment in rewriting your code or writing a new code from scratch that would align well with this cloud paradigm where you you know, uh, create your software as microservices, stateless, so that they can be uh, stood up and killed, and it doesn't really matter whether, you know, uh, 100 is running or 150. Um, here in this particular example, we still have a, a large number of customers who care about those traditional ap applications. But on the other hand, we want to take advantage of those latest advancements in compute uh, science, specifically in cloud, so that we can deploy uh, those applications, stand up the infrastructure and deploy the, those applications quickly, right? So our challenge here was to come up with a methodology that would allow us to automate the whole process, the whole shebang, so to say, right? From going to the customer location with just hardware available for us and then automating this entire process of standing up your uh, cloud and then standing up your uh, application specific infrastructure including middleware and then deploying the application itself in an automated fashion, right? So the use case here was to provision that infrastructure for this multi-tier J2EE app, right? Uh, typically a lot of our customers use those J2EE applications written according to this uh, development pattern and then be able to stand up the infrastructure and deploy the application in three or less than three simple steps. So that was our challenge. So what are the uh, quantitative benefits that we achieved by doing this that way? So obviously improved time to value because instead of spending sometimes, believe it or not, in complex situations, we could spend a couple weeks standing up the infrastructure especially if it was heterogeneous infrastructure that included power and Intel 
and then having um, complex databases to, uh, to be set up. So we can basically shrink down this time to one hour. And one hour is, uh, full disclosure here, is meant as one hour from the time that you already have your cloud up and running, right? We have the automated process to stand up our cloud, but that's not the uh, subject of this particular talk. So then, obviously, once you have this all set up in that agile fashion, you can change your environment, add, remove workloads, auto-scale those workloads pretty rapidly. And by doing that, so we also achieved a uh, quite high level of cost savings, right? Uh, in that old days, uh, setting up this whole infrastructure, setting up your applications was very labor intensive. Also, we had a whole uh, set of scripts that you can run, but nevertheless, there was always a human involved in going actually to the physical system, installing the operating system, then running those scripts. Uh, one additional aspect of this is that, uh, you know, all of those installations are slightly different. When we go install a well-known, that I'm not supposed to say, but well-known enterprise uh, ERP system, then they have a tech note, which is probably like 10 pages, which tell you how do you need to install your operating system for that system to work, right? So obviously somebody had to automate that and had a script, but somebody need to still go and install it, and it takes time. So all of this has been automated. All right, so my pitch here is really what I want to convey is that with this new approach, we are basically gluing together or bridging two paradigms. There was an old paradigm going back to my four fundamental services in in every data center or every uh, computer shop, which is in the old days, there was a huge difference between operations and then DevOps and software deployment. Operations had their own tools, they had their own procedures, scripts, and so forth that would stand up the infrastructure. So ways how you install your hardware, how you wire this, how you install your network, how you configure your network, how you install your operating system, and so forth. Right? That's the one discipline which was in itself pretty contained and well defined. On the other hand, you had all these DevOps people that had their own tooling and their own procedures. How once that whole infrastructure is set up, how do you go and actually install those pieces of software? How do you take the stack, which may be very complex, and install it in a uh, repeatable and uh, manageable manner? So two disciplines, different tools, different things that you need to do. What I'm showing you here is with this new approach, which is heat-based, open stack heat-based, I can now glue this together. I can basically bridge this gap and have one consistent set of tools, open stack and the uh, environment of open stack. And then I have one scripting language, which is the heat template language. YAML, that I can use to describe both my software pattern, which describes my software architecture in this particular example, this J2EE. So I have multi-tier application, which consists of multi-tiers. Each tier is a different set of, again, uh, software components that needs to be stand up in a specific order. They also need to be wired together, meaning that the uh, application server needs to know where the um, data server resides and how do I connect to it, what, my, what are my credentials and so forth. So all of this right, can be now expressed in that one format. I can create one simple template that takes care of both my application patterns and my infrastructure patterns. Right? This, is, this is something that people do not realize oftentimes, that this is now possible. It's, available for you today. So my, the rest of my <coughs> session here will be to kind of trying to convey that storyline that you can actually now take your infrastructure, describe in a standard fashion, and take your software stack, describe in a standard fashion, put it all together in one set of templates and deploy it as a unit and manage this as a unit. This is a huge advantage. All right. 
So this is my kind of web app pattern. Uh, I simplified this so that we can, you know, uh, handle this 40 minutes uh, time limit. But it shows all the main components here, right? So first of all, I want to have a load balancer, right? So I want to have one IP address to which I can go and hit that IP address and get access to my app. Then you have a cluster of application servers. In our example, it's a WebSphere Liberty profile servers, but it could be anything else, right? We just use this uh, for a lot of uh, IBM customers. Within that application server, you have your application running. In our uh, particular example, in this use case, it was a web customer credit application, okay? Which needs to be deployed into each individual of those servers. And then you have a backend database for data persistency. The application is using JPA, so Java Persistency API, to persist data in the DB2. In our case, the backend database is a DB2. Okay? So that's the storyline here. That's my web pattern. So how does this actually translate into infrastructure requirements? Well, so for the DB2, and again, that's the requirement which is based on those tech notes or specs coming from our customers, which tell you, you shall use this or that operating system because we are only certified on that or other operating system level and release. So in our case, it was Red Hat 6.5. So I needed to provision a virtual machine uh, based on Red Hat. And I wanted to be able to connect to this machine over a private network, simply. Then I've got the Liberty Profile VMs, the application server VMs. And again, it needs to use the Red Hat 6.5. It needs to have a access to private network. And in addition, I want to scale. Okay? And I want to use the heat auto-scaling capability to scale this cluster up and down as my workload increases or decreases. All right? In addition to that, I want to also leverage one of the features which are part of the IBM distribution of OpenStack, which is called uh, Holistic Scheduler. Using this holistic scheduler, what, what I can do is I can improve the resiliency of my topology by specifying uh, policy, placement policies. You'll see this in an example in a sec. But in our to express this in a, in a, in a kind of using words, what I want to do is I want to spread my VMs across available availability zones. And then I want to also make sure that if one of the availability zones dies, or if one of those zones dies, I lose no more than 50% of my application servers. And oh, by the way, while you add it, also make sure that within the availability zone, each of those virtual machines run on a separate host. Right? So think of it for a sec. It's a pretty, pretty uh, well-defined business policy that now, using the extensions uh, which are provided by IBM to the, to the Nova scheduler, I can actually implement, and how, you'll see in a second, but this is something which goes beyond your traditional scheduling in Nova, all right? But this is also driven, obviously, by our business needs. It's not something that we made up out of thin air. That's actually one of the use cases of one of our large customers who told us to do it that way, okay? And we implemented this. There is other possibilities as well. Then for the heat uh, load balancer, right? I want to manage those, uh, this group of uh, homogeneous VMs. In our case, that's the Liberty Profile VMs. I want to manage this as a pool. And then I want to also assign a floating IP that I will use to hit that application with this one single floating IP, and the load balancer is responsible for distributing, dispatching work requests uh, to available servers. All right. So um, let's talk a little bit about this topology-aware placement, because it's, I think it's a unique value that we bring to the table. Uh, for those of you who are intimate with um, OpenStack, you probably heard about the project called Gantt, G-A-N-T-T. And that's going into this direction. The difference here is that we already have it. And we work with the community to move the community into this direction, right? But uh, just by the virtue of us having that business need ex expressed by multiple customers, we decided to implement this kind of a little bit ahead of curve, if you wish. 
So in our case, let's think about an example such that I've got two availability zones, and I've got, um, in each of those, I have several servers. Let's say that I want to deploy initially four uh, application server instances. They run as a virtual machine. Within this virtual machine, I have obviously my uh, Liberty Profile instance running. And then within that in, uh, Liberty Profile, I've got my application running, my web credit application up and running. So I've got four copies of those, right? And as you can see, I've got two availability zones. So what I want to achieve is the, the, the placement that will assure that if one of those availability zones dies, I still have 50% of my application servers up and running, and that's guaranteed here, right? All right, so think of it for a second. The mapping, right? One host running one virtual machine. Within the virtual machine, you have your application server, which in turn is running your app. All right, so that's our topology. So this is how we actually do it. I'm not going to go into gory detail and uh, the chart here is more for a reference. Uh, it's not probably 100% technical or accurate, but it doesn't really matter here. What I want to drive home here is that we've done some enhancements to the stack to be able to provide this topology aware uh, uh, scheduler. All right? And for that, we had to enhance heat engine itself. So we have plug-in points now in heat engine that allow us to call out from heat engine to our, to our scheduler before anything else happens. So typically, if you know how heat works, is heat works basically taking your template and going resource by resource. So for example, if heat encounters a request for a resource of type server, it's going to go to the Nova scheduler and say, I need a server. And the Nova scheduler will try to place it, and if it succeeds, then comes back to the heat and says, yep, I created that server for you. Server is basically equivalent to virtual machine here, right? Also not necessary. So now, and it goes one by one. So it goes top to bottom, and every time it encounters a resource of type server, it goes and asks Nova to create that resource. And then only after all of this happens in sequence and successfully, your stack will change the status to stack created, which means all the resources you requested have been created. But it's a kind of, as you know, step-by-step -step, uh, sequential process. What we do here differently is we actually take the entire heat template, we kick it out to our ego, as we call it, the holistic scheduler, which processes this in its entirety. Right? So what we do here is we actually solve we are solving the, the uh, uh, hard NP problem, right? And we do it using a piece of technology out of IBM Research, which is, if you're interested, called BSA, which stands for a bias sampling algorithm. But we basically take your entire request and we create an allocation plan. So at the time when we finish processing this, we already know where all those resources will reside, right? And then we go back to heat and we say, OK, do your job. And now heat starts doing what heat does, going to Nova and saying, well, Nova, I need a VM. But Nova is now also plugged into our scheduler piece. And now a scheduler knows, oh, I've seen that request before. And oh, by the way, I actually have already an allocation for that. So here's your allocation. So this VM ends up on the very system where it needs to go to basically fulfill this request to honor this policy that I just described. Okay, so this is roughly how it, how it works. All right, so in terms of policies, there's a number of policies that we implemented, and some of them will be implemented in the near future, that the one with the asterisk at the bottom. But basically, we have several policies that are already there. One is what we call intra group policy, which allows you to say, OK, so I've got a bunch of homogeneous VMs, and I want to apply a anti-affinity policy to this homogeneous set of VMs for availability reasons. So the placement will go and spread them across nodes or availability zones or what have you. Another policy is I want them close together, right? So that's your affinity. 
policy. So we have this for intra-group. Then we have intergroup policies, which allow you to do the same, but between the groups of VMs. So for example, you have a group of uh, web server VMs, and you have a group of application server VMs, and you want to deploy them in an anti-affinity manner, right? So you can also specify that. And then finally, you have something which kind of joins this all together. So you can have a policy which says, I want to, within the group, I want to anti-affinity or affinity, say, and then between those two groups, I want anti-affinity, right? So there is a way how you can express this in policies. So there is a whole bunch of capabilities here, and I will just touch upon one, which is uh, implementing the scenario that I described. So for that whole thing to work, obviously you need to know what's the topology. And we describe the topology using this simple XML syntax. So when you pay attention to, to this sample, to this snippet, you will see that basically we define uh, levels in the topology hierarchy. Right? In this particular example, it's pretty simple. It's two level. Uh, we have availability zone, and then within availability zone, we have hosts. So we define our hierarchy, and then we also define the conditions that needs to be met if you want to place your VM in a certain availability zone. And so we name those availability zones accordingly. So we're going to actually go and generate that file for you using a, a supplied script. If you have this type of setup, which is pretty typical for OpenStack, right? If you have multiple availability zones, you can just call this uh, the script and it will, it will eventually create that topology file for you. But th you have ability actually to go and manually create any kind of topology that reflects your particular environment. So you can, for example, be in the HPC business, high performance computing business, where you m probably operate on the level of uh, data centers, racks, and nodes, right? And you could express this hierarchy here as well, right? And that would work the same. Uh, all right. So how do you then, uh, how many of you attended the session, the heat session on Monday by, uh, by Zane and Steve? Zane Bitter? Because they were talking about this heat uh, beyond basics, right? They were talking about what are some of the best practices for using heat templates and so forth? And they were also referring to this example that you can actually nest your templates or nest, have a nested stack. And that makes a lot of sense in this particular example because it allows you for separations of um, capabilities and separations of tiers. So I have created three templates. One is a template which is the parent template, which describes your kind of, inf <laughs> think of it that it describes the infrastructure requirements. So in this parent template, I describe what kind of nodes I need, and then also what are the relationship between those nodes. So for example, whether I use auto-scaling and for which of those nodes auto-scaling is used, and also load balancing and so forth. So this is infrastructure type of layer. And then going into each of the particular node types, like I have a DB2 server, uh, template and I have a WLP server template, which is the, the Liberty profile template. Within that template, I actually scoped it so that it only deals with what refers to this particular uh, virtual machine. So what I do inside, and you'll see code example snippets in a second, I'll do set up this node so it can deploy the middleware, so DB2 or Liberty profile, and it can deploy the application. All right, so that's the scoping here. Okay. So here's an example of a policy annotation, and that's wi in within the uh, parent uh, template. By the way, uh, I will post the presentation as well as I already posted those templates on uh, GitHub, so you don't have to make any pictures, but if you want, that's fine. Uh, so those examples are there for your reference, and I think it's a good teaching tool as well in terms of looking up how things are actually done uh, and, and you, know, you can use some of those examples. So first of all, to make the whole policy work, we need to annotate the, uh, the auto-scaling group, right? That's the first uh, uh, 
that's the first line here that I'm referring to, which tells you that um, basically this uh, auto scaling group needs to be associated with this policy. So then in the policy, you see that the policy is actually a what we call custom resource type in here, right? So it's an IBM specific custom resource type, which implements that topology aware uh, policy. And here what I need to do is, obviously, I need to uh, define the type. But then also, I specify the topology level. So I'm saying, in my policy, I want to use um, availability zone. I want to have 50% as my percentage. So this policy is, by the way, no, known under resource lost per node failure. Don't blame me for this name. Blame this guy, right? Uh, typically, I refer to this as a spreading policy. Okay, maybe that's easier to remember. <laughs> uh, sorry for calling you out on that, uh, but I had to. I had to do it. Uh, so resource loss per node failure policy means exactly what it means, right? So it's if I lose fifty percent, I cannot lose more than fifty percent of my uh, resources, right? That's the policy, and this policy will be enforced at all times. And then within this, I also have another um, policy which tells, oh, by the way, I also want anti-affinity at a host level, which basically translates into put each of those virtual machines within the availability zone on separate hosts if possible. There's another thing here which is worth mentioning, which is what is the mode of this policy? It can be hard or soft. What does it mean hard? Hard means that you absolutely must enforce this policy. So what's going to happen if, if your topology doesn't support that policy? Any guess how, how we going to behave? Well, we fail, right? We cannot create that stack with this policy being required as hard. So sometimes, you know, you can uh, live with soft policy, which says, OK, do your best. If you can place it according to policy, do it. But you, if you can't, still place it. But you know, do your best job to spread. Right? Basically, what what it means is this. So so this is this is again at the infrastructure la layer. All right. So there is also this whole notion of wiring stuff together. Right? That's uh, one of the topics that I want to cover. So how do you wire together those co software components and different uh, resources? You wire them either implicitly or explicitly. Here's an example of how you wire this implicitly, which means in our parent template, I have a reference to a DB2 server, which means, and that reference is actually, as you can see, in my auto-scaling group which is basically an auto-scaling group that creates my Liberty Profile virtual machines. So this implicit depends on means that you cannot go and start deploying my Liberty Profile virtual machines until you actually go and get that attribute from the DB2 server node, which means you need to wait until I know what this IP address is, and then you can start continue with the deployment of your Liberty Profile, right? Because as you guys know, in this J2E uh, typical pattern, you have an application which is using a JNDI typically to um, use a data source, which in turn connects to the database for data persistence, right? So you say, OK, I cannot go and actually create that link, create that wiring between my application my application server and application server and my database until I actually know where this database is, right? So I need to wait until that deployment happens, and then after that, I can go and start deploying my Liberty profiles. All right. So we covered pretty much the infrastructure layer. So again, we use load balancer, auto scaling, and the IBM policy, topology, aware placement. So it's all is good. The infrastructure is all nicely set up. So what do I do next? Well, next I'm going to use those, um, those nodes to set up the software, right? So on DB2 node, I need to install, configure, and start DB2 instance. I need to create a database. And also, I need to return the host name or IP address back 
to heat as the pointer to where I actually deploy this DB2 instance. Then for the Liberty profile, I need to wait until the DB2 deploys, then install, configure, and start the Liberty profile. And then within the Liberty profile, I need to configure a default server, so like a default instance of this application server. I need to create a data source, which will be used to persist data. And I also need to set up my DB2 JCC driver, because I happen to use the DB2 as my backend, so I need to go and set up this driver so I can connect from the Liberty profile back to my DB2, right? And then finally, I need to go ahead and install this J2E app. The J2E app, luckily, doesn't require a lot of things to wire this, because as long as I use that GNDI name that, I, that I'm setting up here in this default server data source, then I'm going to be fine. Right? My application will work. OK. And then once I deployed everything, I want to return the URL to that uh, load balancer. OK. So heat software configuration uses two resources. Right? It uses the software config and software deployment. So software config is like a wrapper, which uh, represents your component, software component installation. Typically, it's going to contain a script which needs to execute in order to install and configure this component, but it also takes input parameters and produces output parameters that can be consumed by others. Right? And then the heat deployment is a, actually a, a implementation, a instance of this software configuration. So I can have one software configuration and multiple deployments if I want. Right? And what it does is this, this def defines concrete input parameters for the specific target server. So it kind of binds this particular software configuration with its specific implementation on one of those virtual machines. All right? It tells you where it needs to run, actually. And it also creates outputs. All right. So here's an example of our DB2 server YAML. And here I'm going to share with you a couple of uh, practical examples, coding examples that helped a lot. So first of all, what I'm using here is I'm using uh, a script install method, right? A so-called script um, hook within the um, software config um, space. And what it means is that it means that it's going to run like a shell script. As you know, when you run shell script, it produces all sorts of output. So first, what I need to do is I need to kind of redirect this output, because otherwise, this output would end up as my output parameter, and it will produce a lot of garbage. And all I need as an output parameter here is just the IP address of this particular DB2 instance. That's all I need. So my output needs to be redirected. So everything in between happens kind of outside of the scope of, of this uh, standard uh, output device. So what I do here is I install and configure first. I install and configure Chef because we use chef recipes to deploy DB2. Then I'm running those chef recipes. I'm creating my database. Then I switch back the standard output. And now I produce this IP address as it was assigned by the OpenStack to this DB2 instance. So when I reach that point, what happens is the software deploy resource is going to send a signal back to heat saying, I'm done with this deployment, and it will produce this particular output uh, parameter that then can be consumed by the Liberty profile, right? So you see this here, right? So once again, it goes and installs this, uses the script install method, and it also ties it to a specific uh, database uh, server instance. All right, so what about this? Liberty profile. In Liberty profile, first, you see that I actually, at the top, I <coughs> define an input parameter, which is called DB2 server name. That's the server name to which I want to connect. right? Then you have that script which runs to set up the Liberty profile. Then uh, it's, it's been doctored. right? So I, I removed parts of it just to fit it on the screen. But again, the templates are available on GitHub so you can look up how to actually do the entire thing. But here, what most important parts are to set up this data source using this 
DB2 server name as input parameter, right? The parameter in this example are passed as envir environment variables, right? Because it's using a shell script, so it's a kind of default uh, way how you pass parameters. So then once I set up this Liberty profile, I go and in profile file, then I go and use again chef recipes to install Liberty using this JSON that I just created ad hoc in line, using this JSON as an input parameter for my instance. So once this Liberty profile gets up, it already knows how to connect to DB2 because your data source and your J2CC driver are all properly configured and installed, right? And then as an output, I produce the name of my Liberty Profile instance because that's where I need to install my application, right? And then here in this particular example, I do not say that this deployment depends on the DB2 because I already did it implicitly. Just keep it in mind for a second because there is also an explicit way how you can define dependencies. And I'm illustrating this in this example. So this is the deployment of the second software component which goes on that virtual machine, which is my application. So in the previous step, I used this software config and software deploy resources to install, configure, and set up an application server. In the context of this application server, I want to run my application. So now it's time for me to deploy the application. And I'm using the same uh, approach here. I'm using that software config and software deploy resources, first of all, to define the script which needs to run to install that application on that particular uh, Liberty profile, and then also return the output parameter, right? So here, it's kind of easy. First of all, I go to my uh, Liberty profile instance, how do I know to which instance to go? I take it as an input parameter, right? Then I say, go grab that jar file or war file from my software repository, drop it into drop-in directory of Liberty Profile, magic happens, everything is now wired. And oh, by the way, in my deployment descriptor, I'm using this depends on explicit clause a parameter which tells me don't install the application until the Liberty profile is installed and properly configured. That's my dependency, right? So going back just kind of a couple steps, you see that what I did is basically wired everything together. So I wired the application to the uh, application server and then wired the application server to the database server using those concepts here. All right. So one more topic that I want to quickly discuss, which is also um, important, is the concept of those tools which are required on your image for that image to actually work uh, with the software config and software deploy um, resources. Uh, to cut the long story short, uh, there is a tool which is called Disk Image Builder, which builds those images and bakes those tools into the image. So you could have an image which is already kind of ready. You can run Disk Image and say, okay, bake it, the tools into the image. I have a problem with this because in our world, most of the customers do not want to maintain multiple images. They want to just maintain one set of images which are valid across the entire spectrum of applications. If you had one image which would be like a vanilla OpenStack image and another image that you need for heat, that wouldn't be that good. So eventually, uh, going back and forth, uh, Steve Baker posted actually a way how you can uh, delegate that tool uh, installation process to the moment when you actually deploy um, the image. So you can have one image which has only cloud init on it, and it will still work with heat, provided you, you follow that example which is given here on that link. So basically what it does, it uses a specific uh, software config resource to get the tools 
on the image first, and then it goes and deploys other software components. So it kind of delegates this type. So in my quick response is to bake it or not to bake it, I would always go for not to bake it, right? Because then you can preserve one set of images that will work for the vanilla OpenStack deployments and for heat deployments. And that's the result of the deployment, right? When you go and run that stack, you will get over the time, right? That's timestamp here. So first you will see that uh, heat goes and creates the DB2 server. All other resources wait for it. Once the DB2 server is created, now the auto-scaling groups kicks in and start create all those virtual machines with uh, a Liberty profile. Once that's done, then the entire stack has deployed. And as you can see, also the policy uh, resource had been properly created. So you not only have a infrastructure running, but you also deploy the entire software stack. And not only deploy the entire software stack, but you deploy this software stack in a way that enforces your business policy, which is no more than 50% may die at any given time. All right, I think that's it. Uh, I've got some, some um, <coughs> additional material for you to look up. And I think we just uh, exceeded our time. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming. If you have any questions, you can come up after the session up to me, and uh, we can discuss offline. Thank you.